Hello, Instagram. How are you all doing? My name is Aaron Gallagher from the Gospel Broadcasting Network, and this is Lance Mosher. So uh, we wanted to go live. We want to talk with Lance. We're going to interview him, ask him some questions. We also have some questions from you all that we're going to talk about and try to answer. Um, so this is Lance's book. Um, some of you have, it says Transformed. I can't tell if it's switched uh, backwards or not, but the book is called Transformed, uh, and it's Lance's story. Lance, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and about the book? Yeah, sure. I'm not going to give away too much, but the book tells it all. In February of 2013, I sat down at my keyboard intending to draft a letter to my family members about what happened to me the summer of 2003 when I was living in Tennessee. And uh, long story short, uh, instead of writing a letter to my friends or my family members, I decided to write a book for everyone to be able to read. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, moved to Tennessee when I was a child. I encountered various uh, religious experiences and religious people and uh, things that made me question practically everything that I thought to be true. Uh, and so I had to investigate, had to go a little bit further, and this is my story. You know, one of the chapters that I actually had marked in here, you talked about investigating mm -hmm. uh, in religion, is you had chapter 18 where you talked about questioning authority. Yeah. And um, was that a big thing for you, kind of coming out of, you know, in your whole journey, coming to that point where you realize it's okay to check out people who are in religious positions of authority? Yeah, I, I think so, because as a teenager, as a troublemaker, it was all about denying authority and, and thinking that you can make your own rules, but I had to quickly come to grips that that really doesn't, that's not how the world works. Yeah. Uh, but there was one thing that I was not too keen to question, and that was the religious figures around me, the preachers or the pastors or the people who who claim to be fathers or priests or anybody who seemed to know more than I did or claimed an authoritative position, you know, they were right and I needed to learn from them. And, uh, and then I found out that not every one of them is telling the truth because if they were, then they would contradict each other. Yeah, you know, I think it, I always think it's funny how uh, anywhere in the world, especially in, you know, 2018, there's this stigma that if somebody is in a position of religious authority, whether it's a leader of a church or something like that, they automatically are like infallible, yeah. you know. And I, and I always like to go back to Acts 17. Mm. Uh, the people of uh, Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica yeah. because they searched the scriptures daily. Who was their preacher? Paul and Barnabas. That's right. Yeah, Paul being one of the apostles who was yeah. inspired and God called it noble for them to check in the scriptures to see if what they're being taught was true. Yeah. So everybody, thanks for joining. If you're just hopping in, um, we have Lance Mosher with us today. Lance is the author of a book called Transform, The Spiritual Journey. Um, just so you know, uh, we get a lot of requests to do promotions where people pay us. We don't, we don't do that. Um, I read this book myself and said, Lance, you got to come on the show. So this is not a paid promotion. This is legitimate good uh, Bible study material. So this book and Lance and I will always point you back to what Scripture says. Um, but we wanted to have Lance in to talk a little bit about his book. The book is Transformed. Okay. Well, I, I've got to interrupt and say, yes. uh, I just proved a point, by the way. Um, he asked me who the preachers were, and I said Paul and Barnabas, but it was actually Paul and Silas. And, uh, and I, I just quickly said that, but it's because we didn't have the Scriptures open and we weren't reading from the Bible. We were just kind of going off of each other's word. But here uh, in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and following, it's Paul and Silas who were at Berea after they left Thessalonica. And I think it's funny, back whenever I was in school, you'd have tests, right? And you'd always have, like, you had right, the regular test, and then if your teacher said you have an open book test, everybody would, like, celebrate. I don't know if you guys remember open book tests or if you still have <laughs> When your teacher says the open book test, you, like, celebrate, right? That's really what, like the test in life is that God's given us. He gives us a book with all the answers. And yes. really, it's just a matter of whether we're going to open it or not. Um, so thanks for joining us today. We have a couple questions. Um, Lance, if somebody, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about the book. Uh, I read it as soon as I, I met Lance a couple weekends ago uh, in Denver and, um, and read the book in like two, two days. Once I started reading it, I couldn't put down. Uh, and I had a couple questions that I took down, so could, could I ask you a few questions? All right, let's go okay. for it. If you guys have any questions for Lance, you can comment. Uh, and then if you have any other just general Bible questions, you can comment as well, and we'll get to those in a little bit. So the first question that uh, that I have is, I love bacon, all right? <laughs> so in one of your sections, I think it was like chapter 14, um, you talked about a time where you were working at a restaurant, and a friend came in and said you couldn't have bacon based on an Old Testament passage, and I yeah. think that led you into a study that 
kind of uh, opened up a, a big door for you as far as Bible truth. Yes, I was talking to Mark Teske about that earlier today, and, and he said, was that your aha moment? And it certainly was. It was the moment that I learned that I have the mental capability to read for myself what the Bible says and actually answer a question that I had. Uh, that was my first time ever doing that, and I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but I just always thought that the religious leaders had the answers, and if I had questions, i go to them. But somebody asked me a question, somebody uh, accused me of something that I wanted to know uh, the truth. And so I, I jotted down a scripture reference on a napkin, stuck it in my pocket, finished my shift at work, went home, it was about 10 or 11 at night, and I grabbed this Bible that was given to me years ago that was just collecting dust, and I looked for the book of Leviticus. Now, I couldn't even pronounce that word back then, but I looked in the table of contents, I found it, and my Bible question was answered at that moment, based on my understanding at the time, and it blew my mind. I can actually read the Bible and comprehend the words therein. And, and that, that moment in my life made such an impact because it's a turning point in the book. It was a turning point in my life that we even based the book trailer off of that chapter. So if anyone's seen the 59 second book trailer, you can go to transformjourney.com. That's the book's website. And the first thing that you'll see is a YouTube video. You can push play on it and watch the, the trailer for it. And it's based on chapter, I guess it's 14 in the book mm -hmm. about that moment. I went through and marked it myself so I could figure out what Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see, we've got Silton Pence. That's just Muslims. We're not bound to the old laws. When Jesus died for all sins, it unbound us from the old law of Moses. Selton, no, that's, that's a good comment. Um, Muslims do have their own dietary restrictions that are very similar to the law of Moses. But if you look uh, back in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it talks about how the law of Moses was given to Israel. And you are correct. In the New Testament, it says that Jesus nailed the old law to the cross. Um, Colossians 2 talks about that, Romans 7 as well. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that? No, uh, not necessarily okay. because, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah Roman, if you're looking for a passage to, to kind of help you understand, go to Romans chapter 7 and read verses 1 through 7, mm -hmm. and you'll see in Romans 7, 7, Paul says, you died to the law that told you not to covet, all right? Thou shalt not covet. Which law was that? All right, law of Moses, Ten Commandments. What was one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not covet. Then if you go back in verse 4, he's talking about how you died to that law to become married to the body of Christ, mm -hmm. right? So he's contrasting that. I would also say this. The book of Galatians mm -hmm. was written for that entire purpose. Absolutely. Now, uh, I recently taught a whole class on the book of Galatians, mm -hmm. and before I studied that myself, I had used the book of Galatians to, to help prove a couple of points, you know, Galatians 3, verse 26, that we're children of God through faith and so on. Um, but when I looked at it as a whole, I realized Paul's purpose for writing this mm -hmm. was to convince Christians that if you try to mingle the old law with the New Testament law, then you're falling from grace. That's exactly right. Uh, and it blew my mind. How can anyone read the book of Galatians as a whole yeah. and come away thinking that we are still under the law that was given to Moses for the Israelites? I'm not even an Israelite. I'm a Gentile. Yeah. When I read that, that section in your book, too, it made me think, you know, in Acts 15, you have that problem, which is called the Judaizing teachers, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Judaizing teachers were a group that said, you can be a Christian, but you also got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to mm -hmm. be like a better Christian, right? Um, so when you read Galatians, you know, I, like I said earlier, I love bacon. So the, the idea in Galatians is if you try to be justified by the old law, you're falling from grace. And I think it's in Galatians 3, it says, if you try to keep one part of the old law, you have to keep the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So if you try to be justified by anything in the Old Testament under the law of Moses today, you have to keep the whole law, therefore I'd have to give up bacon. So I'm glad that I'm not under the law of Moses. So it was a perfect <laughs> law for uh, the purpose to show us that we can't keep law perfectly, right? Um, but we're under a better law now, which is the law of Christ. I, I do see a question that I want to... So wait, so do we not follow the Ten Commandments? All right, we're back. Do you want to hand that one? Oh, man. That's a really... Yeah. Okay, that's it. That's a good question, but it's also it's a scary question to answer straightforwardly because there are, there are a lot of things that we need to describe uh, throughout this. Because the, the Ten Commandments, if you read about it in the book of Exodus, um, it's given in Deuteronomy. Um, let's see, here. what's a what's a Bible Exodus answer 20, with? Yeah. yeah, so Exodus twenty gives you the Ten Commandments. Uh, now I usually go first to Deuteronomy chapter five mm -hmm. because it says. Uh, then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. 
the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Now that Horeb is the same place as Mount Sinai. And what happened at Mount Sinai? God gave Moses the law. Uh, that's where Israel was camped. Verse 3, the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all those of us alive here today. Now, uh, the best way to understand a scripture is within its context. And a couple of the questions that you want to ask to develop context is, who is speaking and to whom is that person speaking? Well, it says, verse 1, that Moses, this is Deuteronomy 5, verse 1, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them. So we've got Moses speaking to Israel. And he's talking about the statutes, the ordinances, the law that he's giving them. Well, he also mentions that this is a covenant that's being made. Well, what does that covenant include? Chapter 4 and verse 13 says, He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Mm -hmm. So the first way to start answering that question, do we follow the Ten Commandments today, is to find out, well, what are the Ten Commandments? Who are they given to? Uh, well, we can see right here that originally the Ten Commandments were given from God through Moses to the Israelites. That's right. Am I an Israelite? Well, if you look at John chapter 8, uh, Israelites, Jews, that is, um, they are descendants of Abraham. I'm not a descendant of Abraham. I can't trace my lineage back to him. Now, in one sense, I'm a son of Adam. I'm a son of Noah. Uh, but I can't trace my lineage the way they could. I am not a Jew. And so these Ten Commandments were given to them to begin with. And it was part of the law of Moses, part of the covenant that he made after God brought them out of the land of Egypt when he was giving them their own land, their own law. And uh, Jeremiah 31 can take us further if we want to go there. Right. What do you think? Well, I think um, that's he's exactly right. You know, you look at who it was written to first, which was the Jewish nation. I think that sometimes the fear that people have when they say, wait a minute, you're saying we're not under the Ten Commandments. Are you saying I can murder somebody? Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the truth is, of all those Ten Commandments, all nine of those principles are retaught in the New Testament, except for the Sabbath day. Um, so if you say, well, do we follow the Ten Commandments? We don't follow that those covenants part of the law of Moses, but those principles, nine of them are kind of repeated except the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That's right. And in fact, when we look at the, uh, the Christians of the New Testament, when they came together to worship, when they came together to fellowship, uh, if it's ever mentioned what day of the week that they mm -hmm. came together, it was on the first day of the week. Now, true, they came together day by day, sure. uh, but the time that they came together to break bread, the time they came together for collecting money for the saints and so on, it was on the first day of the week. And we see that throughout the New Testament. That's right. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, we have uh, another question. Sorry, we're sitting as close as we can to get, uh, you know, we're having some good bro time to get, uh, to get us both in here. Um, so we have uh, one of the questions that I had for you about your book, since we have you here today, is um, throughout the book, you seem to visit a lot of different churches when you were trying to search through and find out, you know, there's one church in the Bible and there's thousands of church in the world and there's only one Bible. So which, which church has some truth? Um, you described the first time you visited all these different churches. What was kind of your impression of all the churches and, and what was maybe a big takeaway that led you to where you ended up? Wow. Well, one thing that I can say is true of all of the churches that I visited is the members and even the leadership were sincere. Mm -hmm. They uh, loved God the best they knew how. Uh, but there were differences. And, and for instance, I did encounter those who were saying that you have to worship God on the Sabbath day. That is the seventh day of the week. Saturday is the holy day. And then there were those who were also claiming to be Christians, but they were worshiping God on Sunday. And, and those two doctrines could not work together. Mm -hmm. You had those who um, were using instrumental music in their worship, and then were, there were those who were opposed to instrumental music. There were those who would take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. There were those who would take it once a month, once a quarter, once a year. And so I realized, even though they're sincere, mm -hmm. they can't all be correct. And so... Uh, what's going to answer my questions? Of course, the Bible is going to answer my questions. So let's find out where it leads me. That's right. All right. So another question. We have a lot of questions too. Uh, we're trying to scan these as they as they come in. Um, during your journey, let's, let's skip down through this. We got a whole bunch of lists. <laughs> let's let's go to some of these. Okay. So one of the questions we have is, uh, what are some obstacles that you've seen people overcome on the way to becoming a Christian? Mm -hmm. 
uh, everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> my, my job right now is to teach people the gospel and to sit down one-on-one, uh, look at bi- Bible questions and Bible answers. So I've seen people, you know, drug addicts, I've studied with people behind bars. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point, they had nothing to lose, so they had nothing left to give up. But yeah. if, if I had found them before they were thrown in jail, yeah. uh, before the law took away their, their sinful habits, then they would have had to give up a lot. Yeah. Um, I've, I've seen people uh, have to give up family relationships. Yeah. I've seen some people convert out of a completely different religion. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was happy to baptize somebody out of the Muslim religion yeah. into Christ. Right. And uh, so we've seen some, some big things people to give up. But, but if that doesn't describe you, mm-hmm. if you didn't describe, you know, a, um, a drug lord lifestyle, if you, if, if you didn't um, leave a drug lord lifestyle to become a Christian, that doesn't mean you're any less of a Christian than somebody who had to give up something like that. Sure. You know, if, uh, if you had quote unquote smaller sins that you yeah. had to repent of, that doesn't mean that you're less of a Christian than somebody who had a, a bigger sinful lifestyle. Absolutely. Now, what you mentioned real quickly about, um, I want to have Lance tell you a little bit about um, some of the mission work he does. So you're from here in the United States, yes. but tell us where you live now and what you do. I live in New Zealand. Awesome. And I work among some fantastic Christians over there to just help with their outreach. Uh, in, in the New Zealand culture, we don't necessarily use the word mission or mission sure. work, and honestly, that, that word's not in the Bible anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm an, I'm an evangelist, and I just so happen to be supported enough that I can do that full-time, whereas my co-evangelists, well, they've got a 40-hour work week at a bank, but they still evangelize where they are because they're Christians, and they see their responsibility as a Christian to do so. But it's a blessing to live and labor among the people in New Zealand. That's great. If any of you all are watching, if you guys are from New Zealand, uh, send us a message and uh, we'll try to connect you with Lance. And uh, there's two islands, right? Yes. There's two islands, right? I'm going to go. I want to go visit one day. I'm on the North Island. He's on the North Island. I'm in the Wellington region. Okay, great. Um, Yeah, so if you guys have any questions uh, for Lance, uh, what's your page again? So I've got at Transformed Journey. Okay, at Transformed Journey, we've got a couple pages on our feed that we have tagged. So, uh, so if you if you want to do that, then you can always tap that. Please follow him. Uh, re- re- show the book one more time. So this book is Transformed Journey. Like we said, we don't do paid um, we don't do paid advertisements. There was a person that had the account way before us that did them. We don't do them anymore. Uh, we appreciate the responses and the requests, but we only do stuff that we feel like genuinely want to promote. So, um, so Lance didn't pay us. This is, I read this book. I met him in Denver and said, you got to come on and we have to, we have to talk about your book. So it's a good book. Where can they find the book? Transformjourney.com. So the book is transformed a spiritual journey. That's the name of the book, but everything else is transformed journey. So Instagram is at transformed journey website is transformjourney.com. You go to that website, you can watch and book a trailer, you can purchase the book, um, and, and you can even find it on Kindle for 99 cents. Awesome. And if you need help finding a link, just send us a message and we will send you a link in a message so you can find it. So, all right, we got a couple more questions up here. Let's. Uh, and, and I also see a lot of questions on the A lot of questions there. on here, okay. We're not ignoring you, by We're the way. We're not ignoring you. There it's... are hundreds of questions in front of us. It is a, let's see. Okay, so why why don't we follow the Sabbath again? You want to talk, want to talk about that? We'll, we'll we'll cover it real briefly. Um, the video we will save it so you can go back and get a mm. a longer explanation. Um, but read Exodus twenty, Deuteronomy chapter five, and then four thirteen. Is that where it is? Where yes, it's chapter four verse thirteen. Deuteronomy chapter four verses thirteen, which talk about that in Deuteronomy five one through five, it is describing the law of Moses was given to the Israelites. Okay, not to the people before them, not to our fathers. All right. Uh, in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, part of the law of Moses. Um, then when Jesus uh, came to the cross and died, Colossians 2 talks about he nailed that handwriting of ordinances to the cross and took it away. Um, and a couple of ahead. passages we haven't yes. mentioned yet. Jeremiah 31, mm-hmm. verses 31 through 34, talk about how there's going to be a new covenant, which is not going to be like the old covenant. And, of course, that new covenant is what Christ accomplished on the cross. Mm-hmm. And it's explicitly said so in Hebrews Specifically, Hebrews 8, mm-hmm. verses 6 through 13, mm-hmm. that Christ uh, initiated a better covenant, mm-hmm. a new covenant, and verse 13 says that in that it is a new covenant has made the old obsolete. That's right. That's right. Hebrews 8. Great job. Okay. Um, if you have any more questions, don't feel like you're bugging us if you keep 
posting the same question because sometimes we get talking about the time we look up at the comment, we're, we're further down. All right, so let's scroll down to some more questions we got. Um, okay, here's a, a really good one. Mm. Lance, how do I talk to friends who don't want to become a Christian even though they know the truth and they use their family as a reason not to obey? Man, I feel like this this question, maybe all these questions deserve a really long and well-fleshed yeah. out answer. <laughs> That's right. But I think about Jesus in the parable of the soils. Mm -hmm. and Well, it's actually the parable of the sower mm -hmm. in Matthew 13. Now, we talk about the different soils, but Jesus explicitly calls it the parable of the sower. In Matthew 13, he gives us the parable in verses 3 through 9. And it's not very customary for Jesus to describe a parable or explain it but in rare fashion he gives us a detailed explanation of what he means by it in verse 18 he says hear then the parable of the sower when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart this is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road now he goes on to describe four soils all together but it all has to do with a couple of words here seed and the seed is the, the word of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Or in Luke 8, verse 11, it says the, the seed is the word of God. It's being sown into a soil, which is the heart. And then there's this concept of understanding it as well. Mm -hmm. Now in verse 19, it's the person who doesn't even give the word a fair hearing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in New Zealand, I go door knocking and offer people the Bible, a Bible study. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they hear a spiritual word, they just close the door. Yeah. They don't give the word a fair hearing. So what we're talking about is verses 20 and following. Those who do hear the word, but for some reason choose not to follow through. Well, we've got in verse 20, the one who was on the rocky places, he immediately receives the word with joy. Verse 21, yet he's got no firm root and he's only temporary. And, and negative things arise, affliction and persecution. So he, he falls away from the, the word. So he receives it at first, but then gets away from it. Verse 22, a similar thing, but it's the positive things of life. Wealth. Wealth is not inherently negative or sinful, mm -hmm. but Satan uses it as a trap. First Timothy chapter 6, for instance. Absolutely. And so he traps this person with the, the deceitfulness of wealth, and it becomes unfruitful. And then you've got the good soil of verse 23, who hears the word, he understands it, and bears fruit. Now, we're asking the question or answering the question... How do I talk to a friend who doesn't want to become a Christian even though they know the truth and use family as a reason to not obey? If someone is using family as a reason not to obey, they are apparently not good soil. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that we just say, well, forget about it, uh, because sometimes soil can be fixed mm -hmm. with a little bit of tilling. That's right. We keep loving them, keep showing them the love of Jesus, and they'll see that Jesus is more appealing than any other relationship. But Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, If you love father and mother more than me, if you love son or daughter, daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. Mm -hmm. So so long as that person is loving an earthly relationship more than a relationship with him, mm -hmm. Jesus says that you're not worthy of me. We're not trying to just uh, forget about these people. Mm -hmm. We will continue to work with them, tilling, if you will, yeah. and keep uh, sowing the seed, showing the love of Jesus. Well, I think sometimes I've had a, there's a young man I've been studying with currently who uh, he basically would be the first one of, of his family to become a Christian, and he is worried about his parents. And I said to him, number one, you have no idea what the future holds. You may be the first one that obeys the gospel and leads your family to Christ. Mm, yes. You know, in 10 years from now, you may be looking back and your whole family may be Christians. Um, and kind of what you, with door knocking, I've had people before say to me, you know, like, I was born a Catholic and I'll die a Catholic. Or I was born... A Muslim, I'll die a Muslim, something along that. And when I look at the at the Bible, though, I see people over and over. You think of Abraham, mm -hmm. right? Abraham was called to leave his family, right? You look later, I think it's maybe 1 Samuel, it talks about how Abraham's family was idolaters. I don't know if, I'm, if it's in 1 Samuel. It's a different later reference. But you have people like Abraham, right? Would God have said, well, Abraham, your religion is just as good as your, fa your, fa your father's, your family religion. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, mm -hmm. if your family is following a religion that's not talked about in the Bible, is not the true religion, then if you love your family and you love Christ more, like you talked about Matthew 10, your job is to leave that religion to follow God. And then what will happen is later, hopefully you can lead you can lead your family. If you love Christ, you know, love him more, then that love that you have for Christ is going to try to help you with a kind of true tough love for your family to bring them into a true religion too. So, okay, we're getting a lot of questions. Battery, so we're going to... 
talk for a couple more minutes. All right. How about this one? Um, let's see. We already kind of talked about that. Um, what do you think? Which of those three do you want? Oh, man. I'll let you pick. You're the guest. Uh, I like them. That one right Number there. Number 12? Yeah. Okay, what can we do to help someone who has a sin of addiction? Um, the, I think this is a great question. Uh, you know, a lot of times people don't want to talk about it, but with our world, with technology, there are a lot of addictions out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know it, it, it uh, affects men and women, but, you know, something like pornography, for instance, for a man, that is a, a big addiction that a lot of people just don't want to talk about because they think, oh, if I just keep it a secret, nobody will know I'm struggling with it. But with any addiction, any sin, the goal is to eradicate it. You know, the goal is not to keep it quiet, okay? Because the Bible talks about all the hidden things are going to come out in the end of judgment. So our goal is to find something and to take, if it's an addiction, uh, no matter what kind it is, and to find out what the Bible talks about it. So what can we do to help someone who has the sin of addiction? Oh, man. Um, so I, I thought of two things. Okay. And, and there's one uh, that I, all right, yeah, it's Hebrews chapter 12. Now, the first thing is we're talking about somebody who is struggling with an addiction. But let's make sure we're using that word struggle uh, the way that it's supposed to mean. Yeah. Struggling usually indicates what? Yeah, trying to fight against Trying to fight. Mm-hmm. But there are some people, when they admit that they have a sin, they say, I'm struggling with a sin. Well, really? Are you struggling? Are you fighting against that sin? Or are you just letting it win all mm-hmm. the time? Mm-hmm. And if you're in a wrestling match and you're just lying there without, without putting up a fight, yeah. are you really fighting? No, you're just submitting. And uh, the Hebrews author says in Hebrews 12, in verse 3, consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. Now possibly the Hebrews author is talking here about persecution on the outside and people actually causing you to bleed uh, because of persecution. But maybe he's also talking about the idea of resisting against sin so much that it's like you're shedding your own blood in order to win this fight. And so if we're talking about somebody who truly is Mm -hmm. struggling, really wants to overcome this, we can't leave Jesus out of the picture. Now, there are some great programs out there that are are great in helping people overcome addiction from a worldly standpoint, and I'm not going to discount those. Uh, And I'm not a psychologist, so those things are going to be helpful, I'm sure. And there are also tricks. You know, I used to be addicted to stealing. I really was. Mm-hmm. And so the trick that I used was don't go to Walmart, you know. Yeah. And, and there's, there's, there's biblical truth behind oh, that yeah. too. Jesus said if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it from you. It's better for <laughs> you right. to enter life main yeah. than for your whole body to be cast into yeah. hell. So we understand that. But so many times we offer these counsels, these pieces of advice that leave Jesus out of it. Mm-hmm. So therefore you get this idea that there's a trick to it mm-hmm. rather than Jesus. That's right. Jesus will do it. He's right. willing and he's able to help. Right. Now practically speaking, how does that work? It might involve, hopefully not literally, but the idea of you know pulling things out of your life yeah. that are going to enable you. Well, I've, I've talked to uh, young men that have been struggling with pornography addiction. And, you know, you'll talk with them and they'll say the biggest problem for them is their cell phones, mm-hmm. right? And so I'll say, look, when you go to bed at night, don't take your phone with you. Leave it in another room. Leave it on a charger. There's um, different programs like Covenant Eyes, stuff mm-hmm. like that that you can use because normally it's a moment of weakness when you give into something like that. So if you, in your strong points, you add those those barriers, it'll help you. So when you get to a weak moment you realize, man, I can't look this up or my accountability partner, Lance, is going to see that I was looking at it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, when you're talking about that struggle, that battle, I always think about Ephesians chapter 6. Mm-hmm. Uh, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers. Uh, verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God, right? Some of these battles that you're fighting, they're struggles, right? They're struggling with sin, struggling with this thing Satan can tempt us with. And you know, for me, this is, you talk about the sword, right? The Spirit's tool, the sword, the Word of God. This is what gets me through a lot of things. You get rid of those evil habits, fill it with reading the Bible. You know, fill it with something good. Don't take out a bad thing and just leave it empty and not fill it with something. Mm-hmm. Fill it with something good. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's see. We've got a couple more questions, and then we're going to have to wrap it up because Aaron didn't charge his cell phone as much as he should have <laughs> before the video. Which one do you think? You got? You like any of these? This one here, 16. 
Yeah, that's a good one. I'll let you handle that okay. one. <laughs> okay. Which one do you want? You want uh, I was thinking about that 13. 13. Yeah, just very quickly we can deal with that one. Ah, perfect. Okay. Ch uh, this question we have come in. <clears throat> what about sins like gossip? Christians say, I just speak my mind. That's just the way that I am. What can I do to help others and better recognize this in myself? Man. Yeah. Th there's only one thing that I'd like to say, and that's because I, I was constantly around people who they had an attitude problem or they um, had outbursts of anger or things like that, and I would try to talk to them about that. That was their excuse. That's yeah, just the way that's how I, I am. am. Yep. But I recently heard this quote and uh, forgot who it was from, and you know, I heard that's that the... <laughs> originality is... is forgetting just, where you got it from. Forgetting where you got it from. <laughs> so this isn't original to me, but maybe eventually people will quote me with it. But uh, whenever someone says, that's just the way I am, what they're really saying is that you or the relationship we're talking about or even my Christianity or God mm -hmm. is not worth my changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's just the way I am. Therefore, I'm going to take my personality and exalt it over the relationship in question mm -hmm. because I'm not willing to change for, that, for you, for that relationship or whatever. That's right. You know, For instance, my wife, if I'm a, if I'm a sarcastic person... And it, it hurts my wife's feelings, right? My wife's very sweet and gentle. And I say, oh, that's just the way I am. I mean, that's me basically saying that I would rather hurt her feelings than try to change something within me. So, guys, thank you so much. Um, we're going to wrap it up here. We're going to try to have Lance again in the future. We're going to see if we can do live videos from two separate locations and, and kind of add him in. Check out his book transformed a spiritual journey follow him on instagram anything else you want to add no except that i wish we could do this longer we're not ignoring all of those good questions and comments that have come through uh and hopefully we'll get back to you in the future absolutely real quick before we go uh if there's anyone out there watching that maybe isn't a christian yet um you can message us we'll study with you know that the bible teaches that a person must hear the word believe that jesus is the son of god repent of their sins confess him and be baptized uh Read Acts chapter 2, right? Acts chapter 2. Very simple. Just read that one chapter. And if you have any questions, message us. And then uh, if you're already a Christian, live faithfully unto death, Revelation 2.10. Anything you want to add? Uh, catch you at transformjourney.com or at transformjourney. Lance will be live tonight on GBN Live. Uh, if you go to gbntv.org. Uh, or our Facebook, Gospel Broadcasting Network, GBN, Gospel Broadcasting Network, on Facebook. Uh, we'll be going live tonight at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. So uh, that's in. We're, we're actually right now here in the, just south of Memphis, uh, Tennessee, in the United States. But we know people are watching all over the world. So um, read Acts chapter 2. Send us a question. Uh, if you have any questions, send it to me uh, or send it to Lance. If you send one for Lance to me, I'll forward it to him. So... Thank you guys so much for watching, and we hope you have a great day. Remember, always check out your religious leaders with this. Amen. This is what you'll be judged. John 12, 48. On the day of judgment, we're going to be judged by what the Word of God says, not by what your preacher taught you. So study the Bible, follow God, love the Lord, love His commandments, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. All right. Thank, All right. Thanks so much. It's been a blessing. All right. See you see guys. You. Send us a message.